Remain standing, please. You can see him from the platform. Oh, I can see it. He put his hand up, and I was like, what? I followed his hand. All right. Good evening. I don't know what he's doing. He's pointing to something, but all right, it's probably not for me anyways. All right, well, I'm glad you're here. Um, somebody thought that since they were leaving for camp tonight, I might be short. I don't know where they got that idea. I haven't said anything like that, nor will you hear me say anything like that. My wife didn't ask me to be short, so I'm not going to. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Pastor Boer, would you please just go ahead and uh, ask the Lord to bless service since you have such a talkative attitude? All right. Amen, amen. You can be seated. Ushers make the offering envelopes available. All right. Well, we've got a few things here in the other's offering. First off, I have something for the Dykes girls. So one of them, whichever one wants to come up. No, actually, the sweetest one that decided to come up. The other ones weren't sweet enough to come up, I guess. I don't know. There you go. Um... I guess I could have had you take this back to your dad, so. Oh, I see, I thought this was for him, but it ain't. It's for me. <laughs> Woohoo. What? I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> and this is for me, too. No. This says this is for Christy. Here's to surviving a week of camp. And it looks like a bottle of hooch, so. I don't know. I don't know. I've got lovely church members. I know who that is just because I know who that is. That's his sense of humor or their sense of humor. But uh, <coughs> anyways, I promise there's no alcohol in that. And if there is, somebody's getting fired. <laughs> All right. What's that? I, know, I didn't say it was you. Who it is isn't even looking up right now. So anyways, God is good, amen? How about somebody share a blessing? Brother Justin's going to grab the microphone. God's been good. Somebody just wants to say so. Had an awesome week with my dad and my brother going up to Canada and going fishing. Had a safe trip up, a safe trip back. Amen. I noticed there was no salmon up here in my other's uh, offering for a pastor. You can't salmon. Oh, you weren't salmon fishing? I thought that's what we're up there for. All right. Uh, Miss Kelly had her hand up, Brother Justin. <laughs> I know. She, she's really hard to spot sometimes. So. I just want to thank the Lord for saving me and for all of his blessings. Amen. <laughs> Somebody else. God's been good. Amen. Amen. Just want to thank the Lord for getting us to spend time with the family and um, for the new job, the wonderful new job. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Oh, Jeremy. Some things is funny the way they happen. Going down to Saturday the other night, and got pulled over. Going 60 and a 45. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, he passed me. <laughs> and uh, I'm just really thankful God let me get off the warning that night. <laughs> yeah, oh, hold on. Tell him what you told the officer.
See, helping pastor got you out of it. So. I just wanted that. I just wanted that noted. All right, anybody else? All right, anybody else? All right, ushers, come ahead. Let's take up the offering. Brother Jeremy, why don't you ask the Lord bless the offering, please? Yeah, my Lord, uh, bless the offering and bless the uh, service that I have tonight, Lord. Just help the uh, camp leaders that are on the way at Camp Victory. Just help them stay safe. Amen. Amen. All right, if everyone would please stand one more time. And turn to page 230. Page 230. He's waiting for you to go to the next slide, Brother Mark. There you go. Page 50. I knew you were. I just hey, thought it was funny. I don't have it written down, so. <laughs> Page 50. Or you can just look.
Jesús. Eleven, nineteen, twenty. So, I, I'm sorry. I told your son, and he's not back here, so that didn't help, did it? It's out of your hands. You've done all you can do. You've given God. It's no longer up to you. You've prayed the prayer of faith. You're standing on God's truth while you're waiting on the answer. He has a question for you. Is anything situations he's not the master of is anything too hard for God only believe trust his word you'll see his plans are now unfolding perfectly it's clear how much he loves you look at all he's done for all your questions there's really only one is anything too hard for God who's God problem beyond his power to solve are there situations he's not the master of is anything too hard for God are there situations he's not the master of behind us and our burdens are carried no more come morning I walk by the river I'll rest neath the evergreen tree so I'll carry
Turn to 2 Samuel. We can turn to a couple places. 2 Samuel chapter 8 and 2 Samuel chapter 10. We looked at 9 this morning. Um, and our message tonight comes from a couple verses in 8 and uh, another verse in chapter 10. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and stand if you are physically able for the reading of God's word. Listen, even if I forget, y'all go ahead and stand because it's just the right thing to do. Okay, so um, now when we have a guest speaker, you know, not everybody has you stand. That's okay. You guys stay seated. Honor the guest speaker, okay? But if I'm up here and sometimes I get scatterbrained, and we all know I do, you just go ahead and stand, okay? You ain't got to worry about it. Just stand. All right, let's, uh, let's read these verses here. So uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 6 says this, Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David. Wow, what a difference that makes. How about now? Oh, okay. I had it. Hush. I'm going to start over because 
That's the right thing to do. Thank you. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 6. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Um, and then uh, verse 14, same chapter, and it says, And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And then if you go to chapter 10, look at verse 7. Um, and the Bible says, And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. We sung tonight, and I didn't pick that song. Miss, Miss, I asked Miss Larissa what old song she wanted us to do tonight, and she said, Let's do I've Won. And as we were sitting there singing, I thought, Man, what a perfect song to go along with the message. Um, we've won. God's given us victory. God wants to continue to give us victory in our life. Um, so tonight I want to talk to us about conquering and keeping the ground that God gives us. Conquering and keeping the things in our life, the blessings in our life, the, the things that God has uh, given us. It's very important that we hold on to those things. And so we're going to look at uh, this time in David's life and how God preserved David and how God wants to preserve us whithersoever, wherever it is that we go. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, you would just help me to, to, to say what needs to be said. Uh, Lord, what you want said, I pray, God, I get out of the way, let you have yours. Lord, I pray for each heart here. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for the victory you've put in my life, Lord, and the victories that I've been given. Uh, God, I thank you for, uh, Lord, keeping me, Lord, like you do. Lord, I'm just so thankful for how good you are. God, uh, again, for your amazing grace, Lord, as we talked about this morning. Lord, I just love you. Lord, I'm so just amazed by this book that you've given us, this living word of God that you've given us, God, that... Lord, uh, uh, is so much more than just a book, so much more than just words on paper, Lord. Lord, it's the very heart of the lover of my soul, and I thank you for this letter that you've given me, Lord, this letter of love. I pray, Lord, as we look at to, to it tonight, God, you'll be honored and glorified. Speak to our hearts as only you can, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. A few things I just want us to just kind of see tonight before I get into the message, really. I want some things I want us to remember. One, David was a man after, the Bible says, after God's own heart. That was the testimony that God gave David in God's word. David was a man after his own heart. David messed up a few times. We haven't gotten to his biggest mess ups yet, but David's messed up a few times. Listen, you don't dwell in the land of discouragement with the enemy for a year and a half when you're doing things right. Amen. David was not perfect, but God called him a man after his own heart. Uh, to be after something means that you're moving forward, you're following something. David was definitely after the heart of God, and we too should be after the heart of God. David knew in order to have victory, you have to be willing to fight. David knew that. He knew that since a child. Uh, listen, uh, when a lamb was in danger, uh, David did not want to lose that lamb. David didn't want to uh, uh, see that type of a defeat. So what did he do? He went and fought. Listen, how many of us in here will go up against a bear with maybe a sling and a stone if that's what he even had? Or a lion? I know I wouldn't. Well, that lamb's ha or that uh, <laughs> lion's having a good supper tonight. Yeah. But David didn't. He knew that in order to have victory, you have to fight. You know, uh, God promised Abraham a much larger piece of land than what Israel had currently was possessing. So David uh, went to uh, uh, the Syrians there in Damascus. He went to the river Euphrates. He went and fought against these different nations that were actually uh, uh, dwelling in the land that God had promised to Abraham. God uh, positioned or, or, or defined that place back in uh, the Old Testament. He defined it in Genesis where, he, uh, where Abraham looked God said it is yours under the river Euphrates and the different boundaries that God set on that land. Israel was not currently occupying all of that land. God was using David to procure all of the promised land for the nation of Israel. And in order to do that, though, there had to be fighting. In order to take those lands, David had to be willing to go and risk his life every time. David wasn't the kind of king, at least not yet, that just sat at home and sent the armies to go battle. David was one that went out there and fought himself. And listen, he knew that in order to get what it is that God had for him, there had to be a fight. Yes, God has promised him the victory. Yes, God told him, go and you will conquer, but he has to be willing to go. 
It's one thing to say you have faith, it's another to do it. David not only claimed the possessions of Israel, but he also exacted judgment on the enemies of Israel. Um, back a few chapters before, uh, in 1 Samuel, uh, David had left his family, his father, his mother, and whoever else was along with that, with the Moabites when Saul was seeking his life. Y'all remember when Saul was trying to kill David? The Moabites were uh, uh, taking care of David's family. Well, guess what? The Moabites took care of David's family, but the wrong way. And God used David to exact his uh, judgment on the Moabites. David went and wiped out the Moabites and took their land and conquered it. Uh, as we read, he put garrisons in Damascus uh, where the Syrians were dealing after he killed them, uh, after he slew some of them and took their land. With the Moabites, he literally killed a third of them, or two-thirds of them, and left a third alive to serve him to serve the nation of Israel. And when he went to Edom, Edom was the descendants of Esau that were in the land that God had promised uh, uh, to Israel. And listen, Esau was not part of Israel, was he? Amen, he is not. Esau is a picture of the old man. And so David put garrisons in Edom and the Edomites became his servants and the Syrians became his servants and the Moabites became his servants. And the Bible says the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. David placed these garrisons in each place that he conquered. Now, a garrison is a troop of soldiers. That's what a garrison is. It's a, a, a basically he put outposts. He put posts, military, uh, strategically positioned throughout the lands of Israel uh, to, to protect the things that God had given him. He put these garrisons uh, in each place that he conquered. Um, that was an important thing because it did a few things. One, it made those that were subjected aware of David's presence. When you saw an Israeli soldier, you knew why he was there. David's the king, not you. Um, it kept the subject and aware of his presence. It made those that were subjected serve his purpose. The Bible says that they became his servants. The Moabites, the Syrians of Damascus, uh, <clears throat> the Edomites, they would bring gifts to David. They would come, they, what is that? It's called taxes. <laughs> we don't call them gifts though, do we? <sighs> we don't like taxes. But the, that's what they did. They brought uh, their, their uh, gifts to David and they were subjected to David. Um, they were uh, there to serve his uh, purpose. Uh, this is another thing the garrison did. Listen, uh, well, I think I'll do an up. Uh, I think I, maybe I just won't pay uh, respect to David today. I won't serve David today. Uh, well, they're coming an Israeli soldier to remind you that you were going to. These garrisons were very important uh, for the nation of Israel. Uh, they also made those that were subjected to seek David's pleasure. They sought to please him. He was their king. This also gave him a stronghold in that area to see future problems. That way, if anything did come up, David would be ready for it. These garrisons were invaluable for the Lord's preservation of David. One, they protected his person. It kept David safe back at Jerusalem. Uh, they protected his position. He was remained king. You don't think that if the Syrians would have defeated David or the Edomites or the Moabites, that they would have placed up somebody else as their king? These garrisons helped him protect his position and they helped him protect his prosperity, how much God had given him. His garrisons were very, very important. This group of soldiers, this post that he would place in these strategic areas to protect Israel. Then after David had finished this, we get to chapter 9 that we read this morning. David said, is there any yet of the house of Saul? David looked to be kind David, having conquered, having set up the protections in his life, decided to start being kind. Not that he wasn't kind before, but he didn't have to fight. God was giving him peace for a moment, so he wanted to be kind. He kept his promise to Jonathan through Jonathan's sons, Mephibosheth. He wanted to be kind to the Ammonite king. The Ammonite king, Nahesh, had been kind to David when he was fleeing from Saul, when he was trying to uh, find a, a safe place. So he decided to be nice to the Ammonite, king, Ammonite king's son, uh, uh, Hanun. Um, he wanted to be kind to him, so he sent uh, some of his servants to Hanun to uh, tell him how uh, thankful he was for his dad. He brought, they, brought, they were to bring gifts to this king of the Ammonites. Hanun, though, had some friends with him, some princes that gave him some counsel. They said, this David has been conquering everybody. These are not messengers of uh, 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 of providence. These are messengers of, of doom. They've come to spy out our land. Hanun made a choice to follow the counsel of his princes 
And he disgraced these men of Israel, these ambassadors. He disgraced them by shaving off half their beard. And um, if you've never seen anybody with half a beard, it's pretty funny looking. Okay. Uh, my uh, son's, one of my son's friends he's grown up, grew up with, he was a roommate with him in college too. Um, Jake Miller had a, a, a facial problem that he had to let his beard grow out. And, and uh, that's a no-no at Pensacola Christian College. And, and, uh, but they had to let him, they only let him grow half of it out because it was only a problem on half of his face. And we, we made sure to make fun of Jake for that. Um, but th these men of Israel, they, they were shamed by this. And then Hanun also took their clothing and he cut it off all the way up to here so that parts showed that weren't supposed to show. David heard of this and he went to his messengers and he tried to comfort them and he told them, here, you go here to this place and you stay here until your beards grow back because you can't, they couldn't go home like that. It was a shame. It was a reproach. Hanun had done wrong. Hanun received bad counsel from his princes and followed it. He had shamed David's diplomats. Now, knowing that he had upset David, he thought he'd be proactive. So he went to two other tribes of the Syrian nation and tried to get them to come and fight with him against David. They did, but guess what? David had a garrison in Syria. He had a garrison at Damascus. He had soldiers there. He had people there, so David heard of the mutiny. We read that in chapter 10, verse 7. And when David heard of it, what did he hear of? He heard of the mutiny that uh, Hanun and the Ammonites were uh, conspiring against him with two other tribes of Syria. So David heard of Hanun's plan and sent Joab and the mighty men of Israel to go and meet them. Joab had his brother Abishai with him, each one having a band of mighty men, went to stand their ground outside of the city of the Ammonites. The Ammonites thought they had a pretty good plan. They had the Syrians behind, they had the Syrians to the right, they had the Syrians to the left, so the Israelites were trapped. They had the Ammonites one direction and the Syrians another direction. Joab turned to Abishai and he, as a matter of fact, I'd like to read the verse to you. It's a great verse in chapter 10, I think it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, in chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. And he said this, Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth him good. David heard of the plan. He sent Joab and Abishai. And Joab and Abishai uh, sent the, uh, the Syrians and the Ammonites running. They destroyed them. Why? Because they put it in God's hands. They let God give them the victory. Notice Joab and Abishai didn't say how great they were and how mighty their men were. No, they said the Lord doeth what seemed good to him. So Joab and Abishai had victory. The Syrians that were in league with Hanun called on Hadadezer. Now Hadadezer was the king at Damascus. He was the one that David had already conquered, left him alive, left him there to serve David. Hadadezer thought he saw a chance here, this king of Damascus. So he sent his captain with all their chariots and all their soldiers to go and fight David. He thought, well, David's mighty men are over here. Here's my chance to go and take out David. But David had heard of it. They had been put in subjection and they thought for sure they were going to win. But David met them with the full force of the Israeli army. He only sent out a few to the Ammonites and the, Mo and the Syrians that were at uh, Ammon. He had the full force of the entire Israeli army there waiting for Hadadezer and the Syrians. The Syrians, all of them, all the tribes then made peace with David because David sl slaughtered over 40,000 of them. God preserved David whithersoever he went. I love this story as I studied this out this week. It's a great story. And you might be wondering what we might glean from this and use for ourselves today. <laughs> One, we must be after God's heart. It's got to start there. Every issue that we have is a heart issue. Amen. The Bible says, Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We must be a man or a woman that is after the heart of God. This means we follow where he leads. This means that we fight when he says. 
Nobody likes fighting. Well, I take that back. There are some people that just really enjoy fighting. Okay. But when it comes to this type of fighting, nobody wants to go to what could be their certain death. But let me just tell you, when God tells us to fight, we should go and do what he says. I can't help but think right now, I just can't help but think of this Henry family and their testimony that is doing nothing but glorifying God. If you don't know who I'm talking about, this is a family that lost their home. This mother and father that lost uh, their two of their three children. They have three children, right? Two of their three children. The third one is at death's door. And yet this couple is glorifying God. And uh, What a testimony. Listen, that, you talk about a fight. You talk about a fight. But you're, if you're after the heart of God, you fight what he says. We must be willing to fight for the promise of victory. If we're going to be after God's heart, we must be willing to fight for the promise of victory. I say the promise of victory. God has promised us victory. And I'm talking about the fights in our life. I'm talking about the things in our life that God has showed us that needs to be removed. Listen, God has promised me an abundant Christian life. God has promised me a life of joy and love and joy and peace. He's given me those things. And all I have to do is fight the enemy for it. Who's the enemy? Well, me. Society, yes. Satan, yes. But God has promised it. I have to remember that I'm to be a living sacrifice, willing to sacrifice even myself. I love what I've heard many times, and I don't know who it originated from, but I can't help it because your brother's the first one I heard say it was threatened me with heaven. Listen, the worst that can happen to you is, if you're a child of God, is die and go to heaven. That's the worst that can happen to us. We must be a living sacrifice. We must be willing to fight knowing that God has promised us a victory. We must have our garrison. And when I started thinking about this garrison, I started thinking about what it might mean. And I would definitely say that Bible reading would be a good garrison. Bible reading is some play, something that we should have in our life, a daily Bible reading. But when I really think about it, I think that this garrison, this troop of soldiers, I think of the church. We are soldiers of the Lord, and you have to have your garrisons. We must make church a priority over conquered areas of our lives. You know, <laughs> I didn't even think about it until a couple years after I got saved. But I used to make an annual trip up to Soldier Field, me and my brother-in-law. Okay, we called it the Holy Land right back before I got saved. Okay, if you don't know what Soldier Field is, you and I aren't talking anymore, okay? That's a, I used to go up and watch the Chicago Bears play. When I got saved, Sundays became a very important thing. Sundays were an important thing to me before. Let me tell you, this was my, during football season, this was my routine. I got up, I brushed my teeth, I got dressed, I called my sister-in-law Tabitha, and we went to Waffle House. And I had biscuits and gravy. I hate that that Waffle House is closed down. I love the biscuits and gravy there. And then I would go home, and it was a late breakfast, and I'd go home, and by 11 o'clock I'd be home. Guess what comes on at 11 o'clock, Brother Bob? Pre-game, okay? And let me tell you, I had already watched inside the NFL earlier that week. I'd already made my bets. I was ready for football. And then I would plop down on the couch, and I wouldn't move until I finished watching football. That was my Sunday. That was my church. That was my religious action, so to speak. But God saved me. And so I had to have a garrison in an old place that God had conquered. You know, it had been a year and a half or so before I realized, you know what, I'm probably never going to go back to see another Bears game in my life. <laughs> but it's okay. Why? Church is important. Church is important. It's way more important that I'm here. And not because I'm pastor, okay? It was way more important for me to be here long before I became pastor. It's important for us to have those things in our life that church ought to be a priority over every conquered area of our life. When God has given us victory over an area, listen, <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong. I know, I know that there are times you get called into work and you can't help it. I understand that. Please don't anyone get offended, okay? But I'm just telling us the truth right now. But when you plan on having overtime on a Sunday, 
I believe you're missing out. You're letting your garrison down. God has given you a promise of victory. You think that we need, I, I know I've done it. I've thought about, I need to make more money so I can pay my bills. God wants me to pay my bills. And can I just tell you that God has promised you the victory. And if you'll put him first, if you'll put him first, make that garrison a priority. Church, church makes us aware of his presence. When you, I, I would hope you feel that when you come here. That this makes you aware of his presence. Church makes us aware of his purpose. Listen, I don't know where my life would be if not for Faith Baptist Church. I met my wife because of this church. I married my wife at this church. I got saved in this church. I have served in this church. I don't know where my life would be if not for this garrison that God has put in my life. Church can help us also see potential problems. I love when God warns me of something coming. I may not even know he's warning me, but he'll tell me something at church. He'll tell me something in a message. He'll tell me something in my Bible reading. And these things that I have put in my life to help me remember that he's there, to help me remember that I've got a position in him, to help me remember that I've got a purpose in him. And it helps me see potential problems. Much like David was, had heard about the mutiny that was afoot. Church protects our person in Christ. I've never seen anyone grow the way they ought to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ outside of being a faithful member of church. I haven't seen it. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I don't think it, I don't think that it lines up with what God teaches us. And I don't believe, I know there are some that cannot and they have their extenuating circumstances, but I'm talking about here in the United States of America, I don't think a child of God is going to grow the way God wants them to without church. It protects our person in Christ. It protects our position in Christ. I love sitting at the table. I love being fed. And church is a place we come and get fed. And church protects our prosperity in Christ. Listen, it's because of church that my family became more important to me. It's because of my relationship with God that the things that God has given me, uh, I realize that he gave them to me, but I still have to be a good steward of them. You know, the Bible says that when we are a good steward of what he gives us, and when he finds us a faithful steward, he gives us more. And I, I don't want more responsibility. Oh, you want it when it, it's God-given. You want it when it's God-given. So we need church. We need this garrison. And you know what else we need? I like that David showed kindness. You know, we've got to show kindness. It's important that we show kindness. God has been good to us. We need to be good to others. You know, though, Brother Brent was talking about this in Sunday school this morning. It's real easy to lay your life down, to give something to someone that you know will reciprocate, someone that will return it. But when we do it for someone that we know won't, that's when it really counts. That's when it is true love. That's when it's true kindness. Because some will reject your kindness. And you know, I found this to be very true in my life. The more I decide to be more faithful to God, because of the garrison, because of the church, because of the things that God has put in my life and helped me have those strongholds for Christ uh, uh, and the conquered areas that I've been given, because of those I know that Satan is always going to try and attack. Satan wants to ambush you. He wants to ambush me. I know this. Every time I've taken a step for the Lord, the devil puts his foot out to trip me up. And if any of you have served the Lord for any period of time at all, you know that to be true. Every time you take a stand, the devil wants to knock you down. So I found something in my Bible that helps me very much with that. And I learned it years ago. And it's in Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So Satan's going to try and ambush us. So what do we do? Well, first off, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. If somebody tells you something that's different than this, don't do it. Don't do it. 
You're going to be miserable. It's going to hurt you. You're going to end up in the wrong place. Don't stand in the way with sinners. Don't stand in the way with sinners or of sinners. What does that mean? <laughs> You're a sinner, okay? We need to get out of our own way. Amen. We need to get out of our own way, but also, I love principle number six from Reformers Unanimous. Those who do not love the Lord will not help you serve the Lord. Don't stand in the way of sinners and don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Y'all, y'all know that person that don't have nothing good to say about nothing? Yeah. The, the, the person that's only happy when they're miserable? At least that's what you see. That's not the kind of person with sinners. You know, if you know somebody that all they got is bad things to say about everybody else, <laughs> they're saying it about you when you're not there. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. You're going to sit around and listen to that poison. You're going to start spewing that poison. Satan wants to ambush us. And then delight ourselves in the law of the Lord. And you know what? You ought to delight yourself in church. And, you know, Miss Sheree looked over at me after we sung our first song and our second song. And she says, we need a cricket thing up here because, you know, everybody's kind of quiet. Look, I, I ain't expect, I don't, seriously, if somebody runs up and jumps in the bathroom street, I don't die laughing, I'm going to slap you. Okay. <laughs> And I, I want us to be filled with the Spirit, but I don't want us to get all silly. All right? But it's okay to delight yourself in church. I like having fun here. Okay? I like, I like you know, I like playing with the kids and, and being silly, but I'm talking about when it's time to have church. I like having fun here. I love worshiping God. I love singing songs. I love, I love praying here on Wednesday nights with everybody. I love fellowshipping with y'all. I love this. We ought to delight ourselves in church. You know, I've found this to be very true. The more I put in, the more I get out. You'll get out of this place what you put into it. If you invest your time, your efforts, your sacrifice into this church, you're going to get more out of it. God will not be outgiven. God will give us another victory, just like he gave David that victory when, he, when the Syrian army came against him. God will give us another victory when Satan tries to ambush us. And we will eventually, I'm so glad we will eventually know absolute peace. I'm looking forward to that day. But Bob, it will be wonderful when you'll never have a bad thought about that wretched old son-in-law. Because <laughs> you're going to have a perfect mind and a perfect heart. I'm never going to have those thoughts about people. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Every time I start to get upset about something, every time, God brings that verse up to me. Great peace have they that love thy law. That's this thing right here. You love this book, you're going to have great peace. And nothing shall offend you. You know what that means? You know what nothing is, right? That's no thing. And now listen. That don't mean I'm going to let somebody just rag all over my God and talk bad about him. I can praise him. I don't have to lambast them. I don't have to be offended by it, but I can get as just as vocal as they are, and I can start. And don't think I haven't done it. Somebody starts cursing my God and using His name, I'll start praising Him. We'll just have us a little time and see who wins, right? There's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to. We don't have to be honor with people. We don't have to be offended. We don't have to be offended. You know what? If I get offended, you know what usually happens? I give them a piece of my mind. You know what that does? Absolutely nothing. It doesn't even make me feel better. Then I just feel like I gave him another piece of my mind. Because then you just got to end up in a fight. God didn't leave us here to strive with others. God, that's not why he left us here. Listen, conquering and keeping ground that God has given is important. And you need this place and this book to do it. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The invitation song is going to play, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. No invitation song? Come do business with the Lord. Ask Him to help you to keep your garrison. Ask Him to help you to keep.